Hello, everybody. I'm Ken Raggio, and this is a Prophecy News Break for Wednesday, May the 31st of the year 2023. Thank you for joining me tonight. i got a great subject for you, and it's entitled, Erdogan Re-Elected in Turkey. President Recep Tayyip Erdogan has been re-elected in Turkey over the weekend on the 28th of this month, which was a Sunday, and this is taking him into his third decade of leadership in Turkey and with every day that passes he's more of a dictator and authoritarian and that is in view of the fact that he's also the greatest and possibly the most powerful Islamic leader in the world today. So my question for you is, is this man Erdogan the man of sin that Paul talked about in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 who's going to stand in the temple? Is he the little horn of Daniel 7 and 8? Is he the one who commits the abomination of desolation in Daniel 9, 27? Is he the king of the north in Daniel chapter 11? Is he the one that Jesus warned the Jews about in Matthew 24, 15, telling them to flee the mountains? Folks, you're going to have to make up your own mind about it, but I'm going to give you some facts that is just too important to ignore. And I think when you see what I see, you're going to realize it's later than you think, and it's time for us to realize that we need to get serious about what's going on in our lives and in these last days. This is President Recep Erdogan now, the president of Turkey. All over the country of Turkey, people are celebrating his win, but it's a mixed celebration because it clearly was a very tight race. I think he won by 52% to his competitors, 45% or so. Uh, the other man ran on a democratic ticket trying to tell the people he's going to bring more liberties back to them and uh, try to take them back to a secular state. But as it turns out, whether by honesty or by corruption, Erdogan has won another term. And he has been on record saying he's going he's gonna to die in office. So he has no intentions of ever quitting. So we're going to keep a close look on this. One of the congratulations he got was from the Organization of Islamic conference uh, by the president of the OIC, Hussein Brahm Taya, who's celebrating his win. Now, Erdogan has in the past been the president of the OIC. He has a, an enormous amount of leverage with all the Islamic nations, 57 Islamic nations. And even though he may not be in office right now as the president of the OIC, he still has an enormous amount of influence. He's probably and arguably the most powerful Muslim in the world. Now, you may say that Iran is powerful because they, they carry a big stick, but yet they don't have the political clout or the political leverage that Recep Erdogan has. He presides over a country of 86 million people. He's a member of NATO. He is, uh, has spoken many times in the United Nations. He runs with all the big shots in the world, and you better watch out for this guy. Look at this little clip here that tells how the Erdogan made his first entrance into the political arena back in uh, 1994 as the mayor of Istanbul, and he created a firestorm uh, of controversy with a speech he made. Look at this speech and listen to these words. He decided to take his first steps into politics with the Islamist Welfare Party and was elected mayor of Istanbul in 1994. The minarets will be our bayonets, the domes will be our helmets, the mosques will be our barracks, and the believers, our soldiers. I'm first and foremost a Muslim. The poem's lines that he said were, the mosques are our barracks. Now, he was only 44 years old, I think, when he gave this speech. And he told the people of Istanbul, the mosques are our barracks, the domes are helmets, the minarets are bayonets, and the faithful are soldiers. He's, he's basically militarizing everything there is to do with Islam and there he created a big backlash in Istanbul and all over the country at that time because th there were so many people in Turkey that did not want to go in the direction of the Islamization of Turkey. They wanted a secular state and they tried him for his rhetoric and they threw him in jail for 10 months but he got out four months later and he returned to politics and in 2001 he established the Justice and Development Party with Abdullah Gul which came to be known as the AKP party and that's what he still rules over today. He also has played a significant role in uh, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, but he's the spoiler in that group because anyone should know that when the NATO was created back at the end of World War II, it was intended to be a defense mechanism, a defense uh, operation to protect Europe. 
Now, the Western allies had initially seen Turkey as a hopeful combination of Islam and democracy that could inspire other Middle East nations fighting autocracy and economic stagnation. The history of Turkey in the 20th century was that after World War I, uh, Ataturk was the president. He was a secular president, and he took the nation of Turkey away from its historical Islamic roots of the Ottoman Empire and turned it into a secular state, and it was a secular state until the days of Recep Erdogan, and now it has become probably as much a religious controlled and much a theocratic nation as it had has been in over 100 years. We're going to take a look at that a little bit more. I want you to see this. Uh, these two two clips here. One's going to show you about the fall of the Ottoman Empire in November of 1922, and the second clip here is going to show you how that the new borders of modern Turkey were established in 1923 at the Treaty of Lausanne. On the 1st of November 1922, the British, along with the Saudis, destroyed the Ottoman Empire. Sultan Abdul Medid, the last caliph, was put on a horse cart, never to be seen again. One of the darkest days of Islamic history. The modern Turkish Republic was founded according to the Treaty of Lausanne in 1923, which concluded with the victorious allies in the First World War, Britain, Ireland, France, Russia and Italy. Britain developed a number of unfair and painful conditions to the rights of the Ottoman Empire. Britain forced the abolition of the Caliphate, exiled the Caliph and his family outside of Turkey and then took all the Caliph's assets and made Turkey declare itself as a secular state. It also prevented Turkey from oil exploration and to consider the Bosphorus Strait which links between the Black Sea and Marmara Sea and then to the Mediterranean as an international corridor and that Turkey is not entitled to obtain fees from ships passing through it. By the year 2023 this period of the treaty ends. Many political analysts are saying Turkey will get back its powers to be the leader of the Muslim world, ownership of the Middle East and Balkans, and the rights to use rich oil wells in Turkey. Now the reason this is important is because now that Recep Erdogan is the new president of Turkey, and now that he has such an Islamic mindset, he is uh, he's positioning himself to fulfill a lot of Bible prophecies. And I, I've just in the last video I did on the third temple, I had a lot of content there that has to do with this little horn and the man of sin, the Assyrian man of sin, and the king of the north. I'm going to use a little bit of that here in the next few minutes and remind you what the Bible says about that Assyrian man of sin. But one of the things that was said about it is he, he, he has a mouth speaking great things, and he exalts himself above all that is called God or worship, so that he as God sits in the temple of God. Now this guy, Erdogan, Anybody knows that he has ambitions to establish a global Islamic caliphate. As early as 2014, The Economist magazine in Britain published a cover of Recep Erdogan in a sultan's robe, and they said, is he a Democrat or is he a sultan? And the world has had him pegged for a long time. They knew that this man was not going to lead down a democratic path, but instead he was going to lead him into a religious theocracy, not only for the nation of Turkey, but for the entire Middle East and ultimately as much as the world as he could get his hands on, including Europe. And so I would just see this little green screen. Uh, he did several years ago in one of his speeches. He stood in front of a green screen and made a speech to a bunch of people. And then at a massive outdoor event, they projected him up in the sky in a hologram, and it, it was quite an impressive thing, and it all in lines up with what so many verses, and I've mentioned these verses in several of my videos, that it says he's going to be a king of fierce countenance, he's going to be dreadful, he's going to do a lot of things that's going to hurt a lot of people, he's going to uh, make war with a lot of nations, he's going to be strong to the south and the east and to the pleasant land. There's so many things. He's going to build his palace between the seas. This, is a, this man is very much a predator. He's an aggressor. He is an ambitious, power-hungry, power-monger, and uh, a dictator. Listen, listen to this speech that he made where he admits that he has no problem with being called a dictator. Despite allegations of corruption, Erdogan indulges in great luxury at the state's expense. 
Like a modern sultan, he's having a huge palace built with 1,500 rooms. I don't care whether they call me a dictator or whatever. It goes in one ear and out the other. You can see his palace that he had built, close to a billion dollars he spent on this palace. He got a lot of condemnation. It was an enormous, one of the great palaces of all the dictators in the world there in Ankara, Turkey. Now, as the leader of the Islamic world, Erdogan has a lot of leverage being in Turkey there. He has political leverage with all his people. He also has uh, religious leverage. He was a very religious person when he was a young man, and that's one of the things that drove him into the Islamic party and helped him get elected as the mayor of Istanbul. And he has used religion all through his career to uh, gain popularity. God does not leave us without love. He does not leave us hungry, thirsty, and homeless. Erdogan has long cultivated the image of a Muslim Democrat, but his intention today is to re-Islamize Turkey. He's building thousands of mosques across the country. Thanks to the Turks, Islam has found its true identity. He's used the Islamic cause to declare war on Syria. Uh, he's, uh, he's, uh, and there's a great uh, bone of contention, you might as well know, between Erdogan and some of the other Muslims in the south. Saudi Arabia, for instance, is the home of Mecca and Medina, which is the two greatest holy sites of, of Islam. And in the 500 years of the Ottoman Empire, the Ottomans had control over Mecca and Medina. But in the 20th century, after World War I, the Saudis allied themselves with the West, and the West gave them power and influence in that part of the world. And so all the old Ottoman influence that once was held in Saudi Arabia has been systematically and categorically removed, and now it's, it's a war between Saudi Arabia and Turkey. And then there's another conflict between Turkey and Iran. Religiously speaking, Turkey is a Sunni Muslim group of people for the most part. Iran is a Shiite Muslim group. There, there are two different uh, branches of Islam. Basically, they have a contention based on which, which lineage and which line of descendants that they came from, from the Prophet Muhammad. Uh, the Shia Muslims also believe in a 12th Mahdi. That's, uh, there's a Mahdi that's uh, hidden. They call it uh, the occultation of the 12th Mahdi that is going to be coming back and making a new appearance where the Sunni Muslims have a different perception of that. And so Erdogan sees himself as a sultan. He sees himself as a caliph of a global caliphate. He's trying to build a caliphate in Turkey first, but then he's going to reach out all over the Middle East. He wants to take all the nations of the South. He wants, he, naturally, he wants Syria. He wants to get into northern Iraq. He wants to take over Palestine. He has aligned himself with Palestine Authority. He's aligned himself with Hamas and sent millions and millions of dollars to support the Palestinian Authority, the Hamas terrorists, the Hezbollah terrorists. He's worked with the Iranian Revolutionary Guard, and he's a very dangerous Muslim uh, from our point of view here. You see this here, the picture of the flag of the prophet. Now here is a biblical perspective I want you to think about. John said in Revelation 11, And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar, and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple, leave out, and measure it not, for it's given to the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty-two months. Now this tells us that there will be a third temple on the Temple Mount during the Great Tribulation. But John says that, the, that God spoke to him through the angel and said, you measure that temple because that's all the Jews have access to because outside the temple is given to the Gentiles and the holy city they're going to tread underfoot for it in two months. And I've quoted so many times from Zechariah 13 and verses 7 and 8 that says two-thirds of uh, Israel is going to die during that period right before the Battle of Armageddon, and one-third of them are going to be tried in the fire like gold and silver is tried in the fire. I've also quoted from Luke 21, 20, where Jesus said, When you see Jerusalem compassed with armies, you know the desolation thereof is nigh. So this prophecy in Revelation 11, the angel is saying, you might as well recognize, although there will be a temple, 
everything outside that temple will be under control of the Gentiles. And we presume that because these are mostly Muslims or an international community, that it's going to be Muslims and globalists that's going to be running over Jerusalem for 42 months. Now, I'm showing you here the flag of the prophet because there is a, an old story. I've got it on my website. An article that was published in, I think, in the late 1890s by Littell's magazine, and it claimed that the green flag of the prophet Mohammed was in storage in a museum in the top copy palace in Istanbul, along with some of the artifacts. They said there was, a, there was hair, there was teeth of the, of the prophet Mohammed, there was hair from the tail of Mohammed's horse, there was Mohammed's green sword and Mohammed's green flag. And it was said in this article in Lutel's magazine over 100 years ago that when the green flag of the prophet Mohammed is raised over the blue mosque in Istanbul, it is a signal to all of Islam that it's time to go to war against all of Christianity. Now guys, this Bible prophesies that there's going to be a beast and a false prophet on the Temple Mount when Jesus comes back. And if you listen to all I teach here in the next few minutes about this Islamic man of sin, about this Assyrian man of sin, and this little horn, and this king of the north, then you're going to realize that it's a very strong possibility that Recep Tayyip Erdogan is going to be that man, and he's going to be working with the Pope. Now, on one hand, you'd think that Islam and Catholicism were enemies. In fact, they are, but they play silly games, and they pretend that they're working together. In fact, let me show you this little clip here of Pope Francis visiting Erdogan's palace. In fact, Pope Francis was the first official visitor to the new palace when it was opened up in 2015. And we know, uh, reading between the lines, why Erdogan did that, because Erdogan's no dummy. He knows that the Pope has an enormous amount of influence all over the world, that he rules over a billion and a half Catholics, but he has power and influence in every state house and, and government in the world. And Erdogan wants influence with the Pope, and so he brought him to the palace there and showed him around. And these two have made speeches together, and they have pleaded for a cause. And you've seen, you've seen the Abraham Accords, how they bring in the Catholic Church and Muslims together, and how they're trying to pretend there's going to be peace. And I'm just going to remind you what the Apostle Paul said. When they cry peace and safety, you know that sudden destruction is on the way. And when that green flag of the prophet is flown in Istanbul, you better watch out. There's going to be a war, and the Bible calls it Armageddon. You're going to see uh, the beast and the false prophet involved in this for the last 42 months. That Muslim man of sin is going to be there when Jesus comes back. The Pope is going to be there when Jesus comes back. They will have desecrated that new third temple. They will have taken over the Temple Mount. They will have persecuted the Jews. They will have murdered countless multitudes of the Jews. They will have controlled all the politics and geography of that region, and it will take Jesus Christ at his coming to bring it all back into proper perspective. And here's where I want to show you another clip of Mr. Erdogan as he uh, meets with Vladimir Putin of Russia and Mr. Rouhani, who was the president of Iran. Here is evidence of the Ezekiel 38 war, which is the Battle of Armageddon. The Bible tells us that before Jesus comes, that there's going to be a great war involving the ancient names of Gog and Magog, which we know as Russia. Also, uh, Gomer and Tagarma is going to be involved. That's Turkey. Persia is going to be at Armageddon. That's Iran. Ethiopia and Libya are going to be there. The Ten Horns of Europe are going to be there. And the kings of the east are going to be there. So the Battle of Armageddon is going to have Russia, Turkey, Iran, Ethiopia, Libya, Ten Horns of Europe, and possibly China is going to be there. And Jesus is going to come and destroy them all when he comes. Folks, we've got so much evidence. And I'm compelled to ask you today, I want to ask you this question. Can you not see there is a strong argument to be had to say that Recep Erdogan stands a very strong chance of becoming the man of sin the Bible prophesied? Jesus said, when you see that man stand in the temple, let them which in Judea flee to the mountains, for then shall be great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of this world to this time, no shall, nor shall ever be. What am I saying to you and me? We could be closer to 
the great tribulation than anybody can even imagine. This man is uh, entering his third decade of uh, dictatorial power. And let me show you this little clip. And disturbance uh, targeting uh, the Al-Aqsa Mosque and the uh, Palestinian Muslims. And I'd like to start by expressing our sorrows, uh, sorrow about this. Attacking uh, people who are protesting uh, with different uh, tools uh, is uh, not a, a good sign. Despite all the frank warnings, uh, this wave of violence uh, by the Israeli police uh, is backed by the uh, problem that they have inside. This is politics of oppression, blood and provocation. In the face of such attacks, Turkey will never, can never remain silent or not do anything. Attacking the Al-Aqsa Mosque or disrespecting the sanctity of Harem-i Sherif is our red line. When necessary, the Palestinian brothers and sisters uh, protect Al-Quds at the cost of their lives and they are not unsupported. This is the first Qibla of Muslims and such uh, vile attacks uh, actions against it I condemn on behalf of my nation and my country and I make a call to stop such attacks as soon as possible. Uh, I showed you this clip from 1923 how that at the end of 1923 the way they reestablished the borders of Turkey, the rules of that border were for set to be in place for a hundred years. And Recep Erdogan has been on the record saying that in 2023 he's going to re start rebuilding the Ottoman Empire, and I expect that's what he's going to try to do. Now, I want to change the subject and tell you the reason why this third temple is so important, and it comes from Second Thessalonians chapter two, verse. 3 and 4. Paul said to the Thessalonian church, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, speaking of the day of the Lord, verse 1. The day of the Lord's coming is not going to come except there come a falling away first, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Paul is telling us that Jesus is not going to come until the man of sin is revealed the son of perdition what does perdition mean it means damnation and destruction so this destroyer is coming verse 4 who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshiped so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God showing himself that he is God now guys this is where we really get started on this discussion we don't just need a temple we need to understand that when that temple is built, it's going to be immediately defiled. The truth of it is that third temple is cursed before it's built because the Bible says that as soon as it's built, the man of sin is going to come in and he's going to commit the abomination of desolation. It's not just what the Apostle Paul says, but it's also in the book of Daniel. And that is the fact that when Jesus comes back, two men are going to be standing on the Temple Mount when Jesus comes back. It's found in the book of Revelation chapter 13, the first beast and the second beast. But I'm quoting here from Revelation chapter 19, verses 19 and 20. Uh, John said, I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. Now guys, this is all the Armageddon armies coming to fight with Jesus. Him that sat on the horse is Jesus. And against his army, that's the church that's been resurrected and raptured. So John says in verse 19 here, I saw the beast and the kings of the earth. Who, who are all these kings? That's Gog and Magog, Gomer to Garma, Persia, Ethiopia, Libya, the ten horns of Europe, and the kings of the east. All of these are coming at Armageddon. And Paul, John said, and the beast was taken and with him the false prophet. Here are the two men that Jesus is going to face when he comes back at the second coming. He's going to come to the eastern gate, walk up on the Temple Mount, and he's going to meet this man of sin and the false prophet Pope. And he's going to take them both, both of them that wrought miracles before him, 
with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast. That's speaking of the Pope. And them that worshiped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. Now, guys, I want you to get this. There's two people going to face Jesus. Say it. The man of sin and the Pope. Say it again. The man of sin and the Pope. They're called on one hand the beast and the false prophet. Who is the beast of Revelation 13? He said, I stood on the sand of the sea. I saw a beast rise up out of the sea having seven heads and ten horns on his horns, ten crowns on his heads, the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like to a leopard. Say a leopard. His feet were as the feet of a bear and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. Let me just read this in modern vernacular. Verse 2. The beast I saw was like a leopard. That's Europe. Germany in specific, but the European Union as we now know it. His feet were as the feet of a bear. That's Russia. His mouth was as the mouth of a lion. That's Britain. And the dragon gave him his power. That's the devil. The devil gives him his power and seat and his great authority. Verse 5 of that same chapter says, And there was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue 42 months. Now I want you to get this real clearly. The mouth is very important. The Bible said God is going to give a mouth. This man of sin is going to have a big mouth for 42 months. But I want you to pay close attention because before we get through talking here today, you're going to see there are two mouths that are speaking very great things against God during this 42-month period. And I want you to see what the Bible says about it. Two will be the seven heads of that European-based world government. And I already mentioned the lion is Britain. The bear is Russia. When you look at the book of Daniel, you remember Daniel saw four beasts. He said he saw a lion with eagle's wings that were plucked. He saw a bear with three ribs in its mouth. He saw a leopard that had four heads and wings of a fowl. And he saw a dreadful ten-horned beast. When John saw these things in Revelation 13, it was not four separate beasts, but one huge beast, a world government that had the mouth of the lion Britain, the feet of, the, feet of Russia, the body of Europe, and the ten horns of that dreadful beast. And if you add them all up, one head of, Ly of Britain, one head of Russia, four heads of the European Union, one head of the United Nations, that's a total of seven heads. Now, how do you explain those four heads of Europe? The first head was the Holy Roman Empire from 800 to 1800 and something. The German Federation in the late 1800s. Hitler's Third Reich from 1933 to 1945. And now the European Union will continue. These are the four heads. For what it's worth, the third head was the head that was wounded to death when they divided Germany at the end of World War. The three ribs was Joseph Stalin, Winston Churchill, and Franklin Delano Roosevelt. They were the ones that divided Germany and Eastern Europe and gave it to the communists. And then it was Ronald Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev that in 1989 reunited Germany and Europe and the deadly wound was healed. So these are the seven heads of that European-based government. Britain, Russia, and the European Union. Who is going to be the mouthpiece of that seven-headed, ten-horned beast? Verse 2, he said, The beast I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear. And his mouth was like the mouth of a lion. And his dragon gave him the power. The devil gave him power. So the mouth is the mouth of the lion or Britain. For example, at this point in time, the mouth of Britain is King Charles III. We've seen King Charles III playing a great preeminent position on the world stage just in the last year or two. He presented at the United Nations. He's a regular to speak to the world government. He speaks to the United Nations, to all the movers and shakers. He was at the Climate Change Conference in 2021 in Glasgow, Scotland, where he mentioned how that he supported this sustainable development goals. I want to also add that at this climate change agenda, which was called COP26 in Glasgow, the Pope sent the Secretary of State from the Vatican to uh, both introduce and confirm his encyclical, his 2015 encyclical called Laudato Si. And at that time, 
in uh, earlier that year, May of 2021, the Pope launched what is called the Laudato Si seven-year action plan in which he promised that the Catholic Church was going to support this globalist sustainable development agenda. The beast, the mouth of the lion is King Charles at this point in time. And the false prophet is the Pope of the Roman Catholic Church. And I'm trying to show you they are already in bed together. They're already working together on the same agenda. The Pope's seven-year action plan based on Laudato Si mirrors the sustainable development goals of the United Nations. The Pope, in so many words, with his ghostwriter, Cardinal Peter Turkson, effectively wrote an absolute strengthening and confirming of the sustainable development goals, which makes it, in my view, the confirmation of the covenant, because for seven years, he's strengthening the United Nations agenda. Now, I want to talk a little bit more about this European seven-headed, ten-horned government in Europe. I want to talk about who the ten horns are. The Bible said in Revelation 13, this last world government will be a seven-headed, ten-horned beast. Now, the seven heads, is, again, is Britain, Russia, and Europe. So look at this map. You're going to see Britain, Russia, and Europe. We don't know who the ten horns will be, but we do know that in Daniel chapter 8, the Bible tells us that a little horn is going to rise up after these ten horns are established, and it's going to root up and supplant three of the ten horns of that kingdom for 42 months. Now, this is a game changer, guys. I want you to hear it. Now, look at this verse in Daniel chapter 9 and verse 26. Daniel said, after three score and two weeks, Messiah will be cut off. That's speaking of the crucifixion of Christ, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood and under the end of the war, desolations are determined. That's a prophecy about the Romans coming to destroy Jerusalem in 70 AD. Jesus reiterated this prophecy when he said that the temple would be destroyed and the city would be destroyed. But now, verse 27 of Daniel 9 says, He shall confirm the covenant. Confirm the covenant. Strengthen the covenant with many for one week. That's a prophetic week of seven years. Daniel says, this prince of Rome, we know he's Rome because it was the Romans to destroy Jerusalem. This prince of Rome will strengthen a covenant with many for seven years. And in the midst of the seven years, he will cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate. What desolate? He's going to make the sacrifice desolate and the temple desolate, the sanctuary desolate, and the city of Jerusalem desolate, even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured out on the desolate. Jesus said in Luke 21, 20, you know the desolation of Jerusalem is nigh. So all of Jerusalem is going to be desolate. All of Jerusalem is going to be consumed. And we see that according to the fulfilling of this prophecy, it was Titus of Rome who destroyed Jerusalem and the Holy Temple. That tells us the people were the people of the prince of Rome. The modern prince of Rome, meanwhile, 2,000 years later, would be represented in the Pope. Whichever Pope is now in power confirms and strengthens a covenant for seven years with many. The prince of Rome will cause the sacrifice to cease and consume the temple in Jerusalem until both are de desolate. And again, I remind you, the Bible said there are two men involved in this. Chapter 19 tells us that there's going to be two men, a beast and a false prophet, are going to be involved in that. They're going to be on the Temple Mount. Now, here's a little uh, timeline of how this is going to work for the last seven years. The Pope, to trigger that last seven years, is going to confirm the covenant. That means he's going to strengthen the covenant with many for seven years. I personally believe it's already happening. I believe that the Laudato C seven-year action plan launched in May of 2021 was the confirming of the covenant, and he's going to do it for seven years, which will take us all the way to the year 2028. The first beast with the mouth of the lion is King Charles. The feet of the bear will be Russia. The seven heads I mentioned, the ten horns, the iron and clay feet, the ten toes. Now, the iron and the clay is the politics and religion of Rome. You see, the politics of Europe and the religion of Europe have blended together because the Catholic Church 
is committed fornication with all the politics of the European political system. The iron and clay feet is Catholic Europe. It's Catholic U European Union. The false prophet is the Pope. And at the end of this 42 months, the Bible said the third temple will not only be built and sanctified, but then this man of sin is going to come in and commit the abomination of desolation, and the false prophet is going to launch the mark of the beast. We're going to see the man of sin in the third temple. Jerusalem is going to be under siege and laid desolate. The 144,000 Jews will be sealed. Two witnesses will arise and preach for 42 months. Two-thirds of the Jews will die according to Zechariah 13, 7, and 8. One-third will be tried by fire. The little horn will pluck up three of the ten horns of Europe during this time. The sixth trumpet war will kill one-third of mankind on the Euphrates River. And ultimately, the, at the end of the seven years, the seven vials of God's wrath will be poured out on the world. And Rome is going to be destroyed. And the kings of the east are going to come across to the battle of Armageddon. And we're going to have the first resurrection and rapture of the church. We're all going to meet Jesus and go to Armageddon in Jerusalem, defeat all these enemies, and then begin the thousand-year kingdom of Christ. The Bible said in Daniel 9, 27, He shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, that is seven years, and in the midst of the week he'll cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, and for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate. Then, Jesus said in Matthew 24, When you therefore shall see this abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Verse 21 says, For then shall be great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world of this time, no, nor shall ever be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. What's that mean? If they were to go longer than 42 months, nobody would survive it. But God has cut it down. He has limited the great tribulation to 42 months. These prophecies together tells us that in the middle of that last seven year, in the middle of the week, then shall begin great tribulation. So the question comes back around. Who is going to be the man of sin that stands in that temple? Who will commit the abomination of desolation and cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease? Now guys, I want you to take a minute here. And if you have to pause this video and read this later on, I want you to look at what the Bible says because I'm going to introduce a lot of information to you right now. I want you to pay close attention. We have all these subject in Bible prophecies that have to be merged. They have to be harmonized. They have to be brought into agreement. We have a man called the first beast, one called the second beast. I've already told you that the first beast is the head of the European government and the second beast is the false prophet Pope. We also have this man of sin in 2 Thessalonians 2. We have this man called the little horn in Daniel chapter 7 and 8. We have a man called the Assyrian in Isaiah 14 and Micah chapter 5. We have a man called the king of the north in Daniel chapter 11. And I'm here to tell you that all of these prophecies are speaking about the very same events and the very same occasions. And you need to know and understand because it's the only way you can understand who that man of sin is going to be is to read all these verses and to understand all of these prophecies. I'm going to look at them very quickly. Pertain to the man of sin I've already read to you. And I've taken these phrases and I've just listed them without quoting the entire scripture. First of all, he's called the son of perdition, which means destruction. Secondly, it says he opposes and exalts himself. Above all that's called God. Listen. He opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God. Listen what's said about the little horn in Daniel 7. He magnifies himself to the prince of the host. By him the place of the sanctuary is cast down. So it looks like the man of sin and the little horn are doing the same thing. But when you read about the Assyrian in Isaiah 14 and Micah 5, we see that it's said of him, he treads within our palaces, and the prophecy says that Christ will break him in his land, in his holy mountain. So the, the Assyrian is going to be in the mountain of the Lord when Jesus comes. That makes it look like he is also filling some of the same prophecies as the little horn man of sin. And we're also going to look over here at this man called the king of the north that begins in verse 
36 through verse 45 of chapter 11, Daniel. The Bible says he speaks marvelous things against the God of gods. He does according to his will. He exalts himself and magnifies himself above every God. So here's the king of the north doing the same thing the man of sin has said. He's doing the same thing the little horn is said to do. He's doing the same thing that the Assyrian is said to do. You're going to see as you look at all these prophecies that the man of sin is the little horn, is the Assyrian, is the king of the north. But I want you to look at these orange texts in each of these columns. The man of sin sits in the temple. The first beast blasphemes God, his name, and the tabernacle, speaking of the temple. The little horn causes the place of the sanctuary to be cast down. That's the temple. The Assyrian treads within our palaces. This is the holy mount, the temple mount. And the king of the north, down in the orange print, says he shall enter into the glorious land. And in the bottom it says plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountains. That's speaking of Jerusalem and the holy mountains. He said the palaces of the king of the north are going to be there in Jerusalem between the Mediterranean and the Dead Sea. So all of these men are fulfilling the same prophecy. They're all doing the same thing. In the red ink we see that the first beast shall go into captivity and shall be killed with the sword. We see that the little horn is going to be slain and giving to the burning flame. We see that the Assyrian is going to be destroyed on the Temple Mount by Jesus Christ. And we read that Revelation 19 that Jesus is going to destroy the beast and the false prophet there. So the Assyrian and Jesus are, looks like they're going to be the man of sin. The man of sin, the Assyrian, the little horn, the king of the north is all one the same man. And then the uh, last line here of the king of the north says, Yet he shall come to his end, and none shall help him. So all these men have the same ending. Jesus Christ is going to destroy them on his holy mountain. But so the question remains, who's going to be there to commit the abomination of desolation? Now the Pope was involved. Now I could go look up a bunch of pictures all over the internet of the Pope meeting with President Erdogan of Turkey. He's one of the most pre preeminent Muslims in the world. These guys are working together. They both don't want Israel to rule over Jerusalem. So the question is, who's going to be, who's going to commit the abomination? The Pope, or the Little Horn, or the Assyrian, or the King of the North? Let me answer that question. Daniel prophesied in chapter 8, verse 8, listen carefully, there was an allegory about a war between a he-goat and a ram. Listen carefully that Alexander the Great would defeat and conquer the vast Persian Empire, which he did. You remember the he-goat he and ram prophecy in Daniel 8. It's about Alexander the Great conquering the Medes and the Persians. Now, if you remember Daniel's story, Daniel went to Babylon in the days of Nebuchadnezzar, which became uh, several kings there, ended with Belshazzar, was the last Babylonian king. And then the Medians, the Medo-Persians took over, and that was Cyrus and Darius and Artaxerxes, and their, their contemporaries. And so Artaxerxes, and they were the last of the Persian Empire, and that's when Alexander came, and he came as a he-goat and defeated the ram. The ram represented Persia, uh, the he-goat represented uh, Greece. Now we go to the next verse, and it says that when Alexander the Great's Grecian Empire fell, it would be divided into four empires. That verse 9 prophesied that when Alexander the Great died, his vast empire would be divided four ways. And history tells us that, in fact, did happen. It was divided among the four generals of Alexander the Great. One's name was Macedon, one was Pergama, one was Seleucid, and one was Ptolemy. So the four empires that came out of Alexander the Great's empire was Macedonia, Pergama, Seleucid Empire, and the Ptolemaic Empire. So you see... The Ptolemaic Empire is basically the king of the south, which is Egypt. The Seleucid Empire on the north was the king of the north. And you have these other two small empires. But then verse 9 says, out of one of them, listen carefully, out of one of these four empires is going to come the little horn. Now this is important to everything I've been saying to you tonight. You need to know that the little horn is coming out of one of these four areas. 
And we're going to narrow it down because later we're going to see the king of the north fulfilling all of these prophecies. Now we know that the Seleucid Empire took in the, a very similar territory that the ancient Assyrian Empire took over. When you go back to ancient times in the days of the kings of Israel, they fought many wars against the Assyrians. And if you remember the story of Jonah, the prophet, God told him to go to Nineveh and preach to Nineveh. That was the capital of the Assyrian Empire. And in later times, it was the Seleucid Empire. So what I'm here to show you in this map is that the little horn is going to come out of one of these four empires, and I'll go ahead and tell you, it's going to come from the north, king of the north, and that is what was the Seleucid Empire. Now, look at this verse. The little horn, according to this prophecy, would come from one of the four regions, Macedon, Pergamon, Seleucus, and Ptolemy. One of these is the little horn. And you can see there was one called Antigenus who inherited one-fourth of Alexander the Great's empire, which became the home of Daniel's little horn and the king of the north. So this Antigenus was another name for the Seleucid Empire, and it included modern Turkey, large parts of modern Turkey. So what I'm trying to tell you now is that the little horn, a Syrian man of sin, probably comes from Turkey because he's called the Assyrian, he's called the king of the north, He's called the man of sin, and he's called the little horn. So, according to these prophecies, verse 8 of chapter 7, I saw in the night vision a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, strong exceedingly, had great iron teeth that devoured and break in pieces, stamped the residue of the feet of it. It was diverse from all the beasts that were before and had ten horns. This is the ten horn kingdom of Revelation 13. But in verse 8, Daniel said, I considered these ten horns, and behold, there came up another among them, a little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth, get it, a mouth speaking great things. This little horn's got a big mouth. Now, we've already been talking about a mouth of a lion, but now we're talking about a mouth of a, a separate horn. This mouth of the lion was already there in the beginning of it, and in the end of it, three of these European horns are going to be pulled down, and another little horn, diverse from all the others in one of the other prophecies. So read this title, The Mouth of the Ten-Horned Beast, which we've called King Charles in this, in this particular time frame that we're living in. The mouth of the lion will be usurped when the little horn, the king of the north, uproots three horns and becomes the new mouthpiece because the Bible said he has a mouth speaking great things. Now back to this map again. The last world government will be a seven-headed ten-horned beast, but a little horn will be the eleventh horn, and it will supplant the ten-horn kingdom for 42 months. And I propose to you that this little horn is going to come from Turkey. This map is showing us from the very ancient area, the Seleucid Empire, the Assyrian Empire, the Antigenous Empire. It's the king of the north. It's the little horn. It's the man of sin somewhere in this area. That's where we can expect this troublemaker to come from. And I think the suggestion here is that Islam is going to wreak havoc on Catholic Europe. Can you see it? Islam wreaking havoc on Catholic Europe just before Jesus Christ returns. There's going to be war, and, I, and if I was to speculate on why, I think that the mark of the beast system and this globalist world government is not going to rub the Muslim world the right way, and the Muslims are going to hate this world government, and they're going to stir up trouble, and we're going to see this Islamic Muslim little horn man of sin, king of the north, Assyrian, is going to rise up against King Charles and the Europeans and overthrow some of Europe. Now, here's a story from a political magazine. This is a couple years ago. Tell us about Emmanuel Macron attempting to put together a 10-membered nation in Europe that will provide a security force in the event that NATO fails to protect Europe. In the future, we know that NATO's in trouble because the, the Muslims, this, <laughs> if I can be so bold as to call Turkey the little horn, then this little horn is already upsetting 
Europe. He's already causing trouble because he's the only member nation of NATO that is friends with Russia. And if you remember, NATO was created to protect Europe from Russia. And so now we see French President Emmanuel Macron attempting to create a 10-nation military coalition of the willing to provide a security force for Europe in the event that NATO proves to be ineffective or unable to protect. I ask you, is it possible we are right now witnessing the rise of the 10 horns of Europe? And then the next question is, will a Muslim, little horn, a Syrian, man of sin, king of the north, take over three of the nations of Europe? I think it's a legitimate question. The little horn Assyrian king of the north will take away the daily sacrifice so it doesn't stop with him uprooting three European horns because the Bible said this little horn will become great and will overthrow principalities and powers. He will resist Michael, the angel, the prince of Israel, and he will take away the daily sacrifice. Guys, this is not King Charles III. This is not the Pope. This is an Assyrian man of sin, little horn, king of the north, who is going to take away the daily sacrifice and destroy the place of his sanctuary. Look at it, verse 11. The place of the sanctuary was cast down, and a host was given him against the daily by sacrifice by reason of transgression. What does that line mean? God is saying he's going to give this man of sin great support, public support, perhaps army support, perhaps all the warriors and armies of Islam will be given him against the Temple Mount and against Jerusalem and against Israel by reason of Israel's transgressions because Israel has rejected Christ as their Messiah. This man is going to come in and destroy the temple, destroy the sacrifice, destroy the sanctuary, destroy all of this and cast down truth to the ground and put Islam in the place of Judaism and Christianity at that time and he's going to practice and prosper so before the little horn uproots three horns the mouth of the beast would be the lion but after the little horn rises the mouth of the beast will be an Assyrian so it depends on what time of the month and calendar you're looking at it if you look in the beginning of that period the mouth of the beast is the mouth of a lion but at the end just before Jesus comes the mouth of that beast is an Assyrian man of sin or a Muslim from Turkey at the beginning of the great tribulation the beast will be represented by the mouth of the lion but by the end of the tribulation it will be represented by the Assyrian here are the little horn prophecies that apply to the man of sin you can look them up for yourself Daniel 7 and 7 through 9 Daniel 8 11 through 14 Daniel 8 23 through 25 let me read them quickly I saw in the night vision behold a fourth beast dreadful and terrible strong exceedingly it had great iron teeth devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it that's why he's not Catholic he's Muslim I considered the horns and behold there came up another among them another little horn before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots and behold in this horn were eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great things I beheld of the thrones were cast down and the ancient of days did sit whose garment was white as snow this is Jesus Christ coming to destroy the Assyrian man of sin little horn on the mountain with the Pope that's the two men the little horn and the Pope are the two men that Jesus is going to destroy Daniel 8 said out of one of the them came forth a little horn he waxed exceeding great toward the south and toward the east and toward the pleasant land which is the holy land he waxed great even to the host of heaven and was it cast down some of the host to the stars to the ground and stamped on them yet he magnified himself to the prince of the host by him the daily sacrifice was taken away the place of the sanctuary was cast down a host was given him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression it cast down the truth to the ground it practiced and prospered then I heard one saint speaking and another saint said that a certain saint which spake how long shall the vision be and let's go to Daniel 8 and 23 and the latter time of these kingdom when the transgressors come to full the king of fierce countenance 
understanding dark senses shall stand up and his power shall be mighty. This is Daniel 8, 24, but not by his own power and he shall destroy wonderfully and shall prosper and practice and shall destroy the mighty and holy people and through his policy also crafts shall prosper. The word craft here means deception and he shall magnify himself in his heart and by peace shall destroy many and he shall also stand up against the prince of princes. Guys, this is as plain as it gets. This little horn is going to meet Jesus Christ, but he shall be broken without hand. This Daniel 8, 25 tells us that the little horn man of sin, Assyrian king of north, is going to be met by Jesus Christ, who's going to break him without hand. These prophecies foretell that Jesus Christ is going to destroy this Assyrian Isaiah 14, the Lord of hosts hath sworn in verse 24, saying, Surely as I have thought, so shall it come to pass. As I have purposed, so shall it stand, that I will break the Assyrian in my land, and upon my mountains tread him underfoot. Then shall his yoke depart from off them, and his burden depart from off their shoulders. This is the purpose that's purposed on the whole earth, and this is the hand that is stretched out on all the nations. For the Lord of hosts has purposed, and who shall disannul it? And his hand is stretched out, and who shall turn it back? God swears to us, the purpose of all the earth is for Jesus to destroy an Assyrian on the Temple Mount when he comes. This same prophecy is reiterated in Micah chapter 5, in the same passages that prophesies Jesus birth in Bethlehem but thou Bethlehem Ephrathah though thou be little among the thousands of Judah yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel whose goings forth have been from old from everlasting therefore he will give them up until the time that she which travaileth hath brought forth then the remnant of his brethren shall return to the children of Israel and he shall stand and feed in the strength of the Lord who are they talking about the baby that was born in Bethlehem is Jesus Christ and the Bible said when the Jews return from captivity this man is going to stand and feed them from his temple in the majesty of the name of the Lord, which is Jesus Christ. And they shall abide, and now shall he be great unto the ends of the earth. That's the thousand-year kingdom of Christ. And this man, speaking still of Jesus, shall be the peace when the Assyrian shall come into our land, and when he shall tread in our palaces, then shall we raise up against him seven shepherds and eight principal men. This first verse tells us that Jesus is going to meet this Assyrian man of sin. There's going to be seven shepherds and eight principal men. We don't know who they will be, but Jesus is obviously going to have a lot of people participating with him at the battle of Armageddon, and they shall waste the land of Assyria, all that old empire full of in adversarial Muslims and enemies of God, even the Russians, uh, communists of Gog and Magog, and the kings of the east of China, and the ten horns of socialist, communist, Muslim Europe are going to fight with Jesus, and he's going to destroy them all. Thus shall he deliver us from the Assyrian when he comes into our land and when he treads within our borders. Jesus is going to defeat the Assyrian when he comes. My question to you today is, will Erdogan be the little horn beast? He's, he's been the mouthpiece. He's had a loud mouth. He's a king of fierce countenance. There will be an Assyrian man of sin come from somewhere in that part of the world. If it's not Erdogan, it will be another Assyrian little horn man of sin, king of the north. And if Pope Francis doesn't live to see this, it will be the next pope because it's going to be a beast, a little horn, a Syrian king of the north, and a false prophet pope. That's who's going to meet Christ on the Temple Mount when Jesus comes. So the answer is we're going to see an Assyrian Muslim man of sin and the Pope of the Roman Catholic Church finish this all up when he comes. So folks, I'm asking you to consider this. Are we in the last days? I believe we are. Are we going to see the man of sin rise? I believe we are. At the same time the man of sin rises, the Bible said the Pope is going to launch the mark of the beast. So you're going to see two horrifying things at the same time. You're going to see the man of sin in the temple committing the abomination, and you're going to see the Pope launching the mark of the beast, and we're going to see... 42 months of tribulation like the world's never seen. We're going to see the sixth trumpet war, the four horsemen of Revelation 6, Zechariah 6, Revelation 9, those four spirits that first mentioned in Daniel 7, verses 1 and 2. Those four spirits are capitalism, communism, Catholicism, and Islam. All four of these spirits are going to meet on the Euphrates River, and one-third of mankind is going to die, folks. The Bible said men's hearts are going to fail them for fear. 
He, Jesus said, except those days be shortened, no flesh would be saved. He also said, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day, for the night cometh when no man can work. Folks, I'm here to tell you, the night is coming. We're on the verge of the great tribulation. We're getting close. We're getting close to the great tribulation. It's no time to be frivolous. It's no time to be ignoring the things of God. Now's the time to pray. Now's the time to read your Bible. Now's the time to go to church. It's the time to get born again. It's time to repent of your sins. It's time to be baptized in water, full immersion, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And it's time to receive the Holy Ghost like they did on the day of Pentecost. John said, I indeed baptize you with water and repentance, but he that cometh after me whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire whose fan is in his hands and he shall thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into his garner and the and the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire i'm telling you jesus is coming to save the believers and to destroy the unbelievers. He's coming to save those that are born again, those that have repented of their sins, those who have been born of the water through water baptism in the name of Jesus Christ, those who've been born of the Spirit by being baptized in the Holy Ghost, speaking out of the tongues like they did on the day of Pentecost in the book of Acts chapter two. I'm urging you, I'm begging you today, Put aside your silly living. Put aside your vanities and your, your vain livings and start seeking God like you've never sought him before. We're reaching the end of an age. We're reaching the end of a generation. Jesus said, when you see all these things, look up to but your redemption draweth nigh. He said, this generation will not pass away till all these things be fulfilled. Psalm 90 and 10 said, the days of our years are three score and ten years. If by reason of strength they be fourscore, yet is their strength labor and sorrow, for it was soon cut off and we fly away. Seventy, eighty years of the last generation began in 1948 when Israel became a nation. And here we are right now in the 75th year of the last generation. I'm telling you, friend, you don't have much time. Get your heart right with God. Go to church. Pray. Seek the face of God. Live a godly life. Be born again. Repent of your sins and be born of the water and the spirit in Jesus name. Thank you for watching. Please like and share and follow me on Facebook, Twitter, MeWe, Gab, CloudHub, BitChute, Rumble, YouTube, Telegram, Truth Social, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Visit my website at KenRadjo.com for thousands of pages of Bible articles on every subject. Subscribe to receive my daily Bible studies by email. Go to Amazon, search for books by Ken Radjo. You'll see my daily Bible companion, 5,000 lessons almost from every chapter of the Bible, two volumes said Old and New Testaments. Get the Daniel Prophecy God's plan for the last days, 726 pages with footnotes, 175 photos, one of the most powerful prophecy teachings anywhere. Get the greatest doctrines of the Bible. Get praying on purpose, praying for results, how men prevail with God. Get long winding road, my very personal story, and treasures of darkness, how to see the glory of God in your darkest trials. Click the link below if you want all nine books for only $125 here in the United States only. And please donate through the link below and then share these videos with your friends. And I'll see you next time. Good night.